Okay, so this is the, uh, you can hear me? I hope I'm unmuted. Um, second session. Uh, the, uh, it's more photonic based in terms of interconnects, but also uh, switched base. And, and the first talk, uh, Catherine will very much talk from a data center point of view about what the issues are. Um, Dan Blumenthal will go about how to achieve some of these more efficient interconnects coherent in particular at a very narrow line with Herbert Blum will talk about the work at Intel, particularly for co-packaged optics. I'll talk about integration and then we'll have a panel session. We have a really great set of, of speakers for that. And then we'll finish with uh, William Wang. So um, without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Catherine Schmidtke. So she's general Man manager of silicon and AI at Facebook and uh, which is the world's largest social network and one of the five largest hyperscale data center operators. She directs uh, social strategy for Facebook's inter inference, sourcing strategy, inference and video transcoding, ASICs and next generation interconnect technology. And uh, over the past five years, she has led Facebook's optical technology strategy and is known for fostering collaboration in the optotronics industry and supporting open innovation. And there have been a number of forums and, and a lot of collaboration with Clint Chow's group here, uh, in particular, on the Open Compute Project. So her PhD is in uh, nonlinear optics from Southampton, and uh, she's worked at New Focus, JDS Uniphase, and FITASAR. So Catherine, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so I had the opportunity to record my talk in case the network connection wasn't good. So I'm looking to Brett and uh, I'm assuming he's going to launch. Thank you. Hello everyone. My name's Catherine Schmidke. And uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about cloud scale interconnect architectures in the context of hardware and software co-design. I'll start by describing the Facebook application. I'll talk a little bit about AI and ML, and then I'll describe um, the relevance of software and hardware co-design, particularly for performance improvements and then talk about network interconnects. So Facebook um, is a platform that many of you are familiar with. You'll recognize many of these icons, uh, Workplace, Instagram, Instagram TV, Oculus, Messenger, WhatsApp. Uh, there's over 2.7 billion monthly active users using Facebook at the moment, and Facebook is the biggest social network um, worldwide. So what do people use the platforms for? They're sharing a lot of information, a lot of messages being sent, over 65 billion messages sent on Messenger. There's 81 billion messages sent uh, between businesses and users on uh, businesses and customers on Messenger. Video, there's 3.5 billion videos that are live broadcast. And, um, and now 50% of that data uh, is going through some sort of AI or ML. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of the applications why, and why we do that, some of the different workloads later in this talk. So that all happens inside one of our data centers. We have 15 data centers now worldwide. And at each one of these locations, each one of these 15 locations, there are six or so data centers at, at each of those locations. And, um, you know, the power footprint here is significant and we're very concerned about energy efficiency. We've set ourselves the goal by the end of this year to uh, contract for 100% renewable energy and to have data centers that are 80% more water efficient than average data centers. And you can find out more about that um, at our website where, where um, we go into more detail. 
So a little bit about the uh, data growth that's been going on in the data centers. The, um, this chart shows machine to user traffic and machine to machine traffic. At the green line at the bottom is machine to user. So that's, um, that has been growing. It doesn't really show on this scale, but it's been growing uh, steadily and um, quite dramatically as the number of users increases and the content that they are sharing increases and the amount of time that they spend on the platforms increases. But as you can see from the chart, that's all completely dwarfed by the machine to machine traffic. It's, um, it's about 25 times more bandwidth moving around inside a data center compared to how much actually goes out to an end user. And that's, um, well, a lot of it is um, the machine learning uh, that we're working on to make sure that what goes out to end users is, um, is relevant um, and is optimized. And of course, then there's redundancy and backup, which also consumes bandwidth. So let's talk about those AI ML applications. Uh, this is just one example. I thought I'd pick one and show how much that's growing. Uh, this is AI inference, and um, this is over a year and a half period uh, back through uh, just before 2018. And you can see already the amount of inference that we're doing as a, as a workload across our data center is increasing. Um, that ramp at the end has continued, and uh, it's around, it's doubling approximately every year at the moment. So we're on a pretty steep ramp here. So what's the workload? What's going on in the data centers? So there are three major workloads and you can see here over 80% of the workloads is ranking and recommendation. And then the next one is computer vision, recognizing images and tagging faces, and then language to be able to do translation into uh, the different languages that people are sharing and communicating with. So, um, so recommendation models are definitely uh, some of the most important models. And as we looked around at the type of research that was happening, particularly in academia, um, that research was really centered on computer vision and language, and uh, not so much the piece that we're interested in. And looking deeper into that, we discovered it's because the data sets aren't available and because uh, the benchmarks for the models aren't available. So. We've, um, we've shared that, we've opened uh, our um, deep learning recommendation model and that's available on GitHub. So um, we're trying to encourage research in, in these areas and, uh, and we're happy to, um, to provide the tools to enable that. So this is a fairly typical machine learning flow. Um, so obviously it start, all starts with data. Um, and the more data, the better. Uh, that improves the models and the results in the models. And then understanding the features. So what is it that you're, tr you're trying to get out? And then it goes into a training cycle. So this is training and evaluation, training of the model. And then deployment where it goes out um, into the data center on, and um, that's where the inference happens. And so that's where the, the more rep rep repetitive inference um, activities happening. And each one of these is growing in Facebook's data centers. The amount of data that's going into the pipeline is growing. Um, back in 2018, it was just 30% of the data that was being used. And then last year it was 50% and that's grown again since then. And um, the amount of training we're doing, that the activities there have grown. We've got more training engineers. We've got more work workflows being trained. Um, and then in inference, we're doing a lot more inference. So 400 um, trillion <laughs> predictions per day and um, 6.5 billion translations happening on the site. And um, on top of that, you know, a lot of the security precautions that we're taking to make sure that the site is only used appropriately and a large part of that is removing fake accounts. So all of this machine learning um, puts a burden on the infrastructure and I've highlighted a number of the challenges here. 
Um, there's challenges in the storage environment that goes uh, across the, the storing the data to feed into the pipeline. And then there are network challenges for moving uh, the information around both whether moving the data in, performing the training, and then doing the inference. Um, and uh, obviously, the just compute processes, uh, acceleration of those models, and memory challenges to have all the right information close to the computation. So this is a lot of strain that goes on the network. And then add on to that the speed of innovation, how fast this is cha changing and improving, and the, the sophistication level is increasing too. So this is another big design challenge for the team. So the only way to get ahead um, is to co-design co-design the software and the hardware. So that means designing the model to fit what the hardware can do, but then improving the hardware and then feeding that back into the software to allow more sophisticated models. And to, so we've done that in a number of ways, starting with the hardware, we've created very flexible hardware. And um, this is an example. This is our inference platform. We call this Yosemite. This is the second version of Yosemite. So Yosemite V2. And um, the architecture is, is quite simple, um, at least when you draw it in the diagram. Um, but it allows us to address high compute and memory capacity with high bandwidth um, to move the data around and to, to have the model move um, at a rapid pace. So there are multiple accelerators and those are tightly coupled together with very high spec PCIe switch. Um, and this is something we can't build with a sim single chip, so it gets put into a module uh, that allows us flexibility to configure that module in different ways. And this is something that we've open sourced into OCP. So this is a place for us to share the model, um, the modules that we've developed. Um, and then um, as part of the community, we've made sure that those modules accept um, accelerators from a number of different suppliers. So here I've listed some of the the suppliers that are active in this area and it's a community driven approach so these are um, all part of OCP and collaborating on this module and then our um, our training fabric is called Zion and this is a um, a platform that actually has a, a number of different networks so it has the um, it has a compute fabric, a CPU fabric, and then it has a separate accelerator fabric. And that's to get the, the performance that, that we need for this particular training so that the model uh, solves quickly. And um, this particular configuration, this ion um, configuration, offers an aggregate of hundred, um, hundreds of teraflops of um, of bfloat bflow 16 and very high capacity it has terabytes of ddr for very large modules and hundreds of gigabytes of hbm um, so that these parts of the model that need really fast access uh, to provide the pro the flexibility we um we led um uh, the, the formation or the, the, uh, the establishment of this accelerator, this OCP accelerator module. So this is a, um, a sub module in the platform that can be configured with a number of different accelerators to provide flexibility. And again, this has been shared with OCP. So it's, uh, it's available for anyone in the community to get access to. So I've talked a lot about community and sharing, um, and this is another opportunity to build community, to build an ecosystem, and that's in the area of chiplets. So before we were talking about the platform and the rack level hardware, this is configuring um, different, uh, different functionality by using chiplets uh, that then come together um, into the module. And this work is being uh, led through the ODSA. So there's a number of different activities going on at the ODSA at the moment in defining 
open die-to-die -die interfaces uh, so that each of these chiplets can communicate and are interchangeable. Reference de designs, which are a starting point uh, for new designs. And uh, reference workflows. I mentioned, um, you know, we've, we've uh, shared a number of different workflows and workloads as references. So these are um, allow reusable open practices. And then on the right, right hand side of this chart, OCP, this is the modularity, the different modules that we're sharing where these chiplets, um, that they go onto these modules and then these modules get built up into servers or server rack configuration. So um, this all allows us to integrate the best in class chiplets from, from multiple vendors through these open interfaces. And this brings me to network interfaces. So not just chiplet interfaces, but on a much bigger scale. And you can see today I'm standing inside one of our data centers. This is the wonder of Zoom. And so this is looking across one of the, uh, the data centers. And this is an aisle in, um, in one of the main, main switch points in a data center. So this is where the, the, um, the building uh, interconnects come together. And this is all cabled with fiber. Today it's all single mode fiber. And these network interconnects also consume a lot of power. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about those. Um, earlier I talked about how the bandwidth uh, is increasing over time. And while the power per unit bandwidth has been decreasing, it hasn't been decreasing at the same rate that the bandwidth has been increasing. So um, that leads us to a situation where the power consumed by the network is increasing. And here's some data from um, 2012, where network looked very small, seemed negligible, build as much of that as you like, doesn't consume much power compared to all the compute and storage in the net, in the data center. Um, today that red section has become much more apparent and we're paying much more attention to it. And then what concerns us is where this goes in the future. It's consuming more and more power as it's a larger fraction of the total data center power consumption. And as I said before, we are trying to be very careful with the amount of energy that we consume and make sure that that's all renewable energy and um, this just makes the problem harder to solve if there's this much power being consumed. So one of the ways that we're hoping to solve this problem is by integrating the photonics onto much smaller form factors and moving the photonic interconnect much closer to the host ASIC. So this is, this is an IO challenge and burning this much power on the IO is, um, is never desirable. So by moving the photonics in close, those yellow blocks in really close to the ASIC, in this particular case, this would be a switch ASIC. Um, this allows us to reduce the power maybe by uh, 20 or 30 percent, so quite considerable. And um, integration gets you all the benefits of size as well. So instead of uh, in this picture, it's uh, just four that we have at the edge of a card. Uh, by miniaturizing, we would actually put 128 around the, the switch ASIC. Um, so uh, continuing on the theme of collaboration and um, and working together, this optical integration, uh, we're exploring it in a couple of different forums. We've set up an industry forum working together with Microsoft. We've sent up a joint design foundation and um, we've put the requirements as Facebook and Microsoft see them for this kind of technology up on, um, on this site. This is the co-packaged optics website and we've released uh, three documents already that outline the performance requirements for this technology. And then the other place that we're, um, we're collaborating is on um, power efficient analog coherent interconnects. So these are longer reach interconnects for our network. And we're collaborating with Clint Scow at UCSB on uh, a program called Intrepid. 
and that's funded by RPE as part of their Enlightened program. So I'm sure you're going to hear more about that in this workshop today. Uh, so in conclusion, um, there's a number of uh, performance drivers that are, each of them are accelerating and we're in this catch up mode. And uh, balanced with that are the practical limitations around energy and energy consumption and all the different ways that we need to be more efficient with our use of energy. So then as solutions to that, I talked about co-design as a way to improve performance and that feedback loop between hardware and software. I talked about chiplets as a way to get flexibility um, at, the, at the chip level and uh, collaboration as a way that I see it all comes together and that we build and share together and create a, um, an ecosystem that supports many different businesses. So that's all I had for you today. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you'd like to reach out and find out more about this work, please contact me um, at, at these locations. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. That was great. Um, now questions from any of the panelists for the audience. We have one from the audience. Is there any waveguide on PCB research going on for board level interconnects? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, so there's no, um, I mean, it's certainly something that we're aware of and that we've looked at. There aren't currently any active programs to, to do that, but um, it's definitely relevant as we integrate and move everything closer together and particularly for chiplets. So it's an, it's an area we're watching, yes. So, I mean, I was really impressed by the, the level of what you, you know, the complexity, uh, the strength of what you're doing within Zion or Yosemite, is there any optics in those boxes or is it just the outside connection? At the moment, it's the interconnect, the network interconnect that would be the best candidate for that. And it's definitely something we're looking at, but it's, it's not happened yet. It's close. <laughs> okay. Any other questions from uh, any of the panelists or the audience? Hey, I could ask one. This is Gordon Keeler. Go ahead. There we go. So um, thanks, Catherine. Great talk. So I'm wondering where you see optics kind of going next when you start integrating optics co-packaged onto a switch chip. That's sort of uh, one element of it. It's uh, perhaps the most bandwidth intensive one, but you've got you know the other end of your fibers and a whole lot of other stuff in your racks that you'd like to interconnect. So do you see co-packaged moving moving farther, you know, up the food chain? Yes, for sure. Um, so there's a couple of things going on here, and I think Raj mentioned it earlier today. Uh, economics is a, obviously a, a strong factor here. The technology is here to be able to do that. It's a, it's a question of what's the economics. Um, so that's one piece. With the, uh, with the interconnects in the network, of course, those are currently photonic net, those are currently photonics interconnects. And so the transition to higher levels of integration is a pretty straightforward path, at least you know that we're using that kind of technology already. Whereas for some of the endpoint connections, if you think of it that way, um, to the server or the rack are currently copper. And so um, sometimes it's just a mindset change, but it's definitely a, a, a you know a barrier. What is the bandwidth connection to like a Zion or, or Yosemite unit? How much okay. data is going in and out of that? Um, so it's a, it's a moving target as we go through different versions. It's um, the server connects are, are depending on, on which version and which type they're, 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 they can be pretty low, right? The network connections into the rack today are 25 gig, 50 gig, which isn't very much. But if you look at what's going on um, inside the training application, the connections uh, that are required within that get up to terabits. So it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm not giving a direct answer because there's so many different factors. The architecture that you use plays a part too. Do you, do you go wide with less bandwidth? 
do you or do you aggregate and have higher bandwidth that might be um, a better architecture, a flatter network and faster. So um, it's it's an area we're looking at. We see a lot of opportunity for tonics in this area. Um, but the uh, the Yosemite and the Zion systems today are copper still. In Raj's talk, he indicated that at 1.6 terabit, the chiplet would be more efficient, power efficient with coherent than direct detection. How, does that fit with your expectation or where do you see coherent happening within a data center? Uh, I, 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 I'm not going to, uh, to commit to a prediction. It's definitely, I mean, um, the data, uh, there's been a number of talks on this in, in different forums showing that the, the two come together and there's definitely a crossover, pinpointing that crossover depends on a number of different factors. It's obviously an area we're interested in, we're collaborating with Clint and the team on that, um, and we see it as a very useful technology for the future. Great. One last question uh, from Rohan. Uh, is there a way for startups in high-speed optical interconnect chiplet packaging area to work with ODSA? Whom do we get in touch with for the same? Um, I'd be happy to put you in contact. Yes, please, please, the more the merrier. Um, uh, so th there are active forums, active groups. Every uh, Friday morning, it's, uh, it's kind of early for the West Coast. Um, there's a call once a week. So um, you check the website, the ODSA website. That's one way to engage. And if you can't find the right link or connection, I'd be happy to make that connection. Great. Well, thank you again, Catherine. That was, a, that was an excellent talk. So very good. Thank you for having me. All right.